All right, guys, this is going to be an introduction to a lot of information. And uh, I'm really excited to share it with you because it's been a long time gathering all the information into one place. Okay, so this is a look at the changes to the name of the church, particularly uh, a narrative that's a little different than we're used to. We're going to look at the condemnation of the early saints and uh, and how it might be a little different than what we're we normally talk about or hear about. Okay, so with this presentation, keep in mind this is more about finding questions than it is about finding answers. Answers take more time. Uh, I'm certain there will be a lot of people on here that think they already have the answers, including me, because that's just our tendency. Uh, we we think of something, we hold on to it, and we think that's exactly how it is. Um, and the nature of history is as more things come up, we go, oh, I guess it was a little different. So I'm hoping to bring more questions to your minds than answers with this, okay? And it is ongoing. Feel free to contribute if you think I missed something, some document, some important piece of information. Uh, please let me know. Send it to me because this is going to be ongoing research. We want it to be as uh, comprehensive as possible. I was going to say definitive, but it's hard to make it so definitive, but comprehensive. All right. So looking at the names of the church, which church shall be called the Church of Christ? That comes right out of Articles of the Church of Christ written by Oliver Cowdery in June 1829. Which church shall be called the Church of Christ, church of Christ which uh, was given, he says, by revelation, according to a commandment where he was told to go and create uh, these articles for the church according to those things which were written. And then if we look over here, when the church was formally organized, it became section 20. We have the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. The Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ, agreeable to the will and commandments of God, the rise of the Church of Christ in these last days. So here's some screenshots. So we start with the Church of Christ. That is the name of the church. Here is, uh, this is from Gospel Topics, uh, slash church history topics on the church's website. So we're going to look, just as an intro, uh, the church's main stance on the name changes of the church. And then we're going to address uh, some interesting points that come up along the way. So pay attention. So first we have the introduction. The Book of Mormon talks about uh, Christ's church, and they call it the Church of Christ, Third Nephi. And we also have other places as well. But then we go down, okay, Church of Christ starts in 1829, as we just saw with uh, Oliver Cowdery with that document through 1834. And we're going to look at some of the things they say here. Even before the church was organized, Oliver followed this commandment here. Okay, and then we have when the church was actually formally organized, Joseph was called by revelation as elder in the Church of Christ. So there we go. And then they also called themselves uh, saints. I wonder if I can move this thing around. The restored Church of Christ, right here. Listen to this. So now we're gonna. Now it's gonna talk about how it gets changed to Church of the Latter Day Saints, 1834 to 1838. Question mark. <laughs> they don't have the question mark. I have the question mark. They, they put it. Well, I guess I'll just take us there real quick. This is what it looks like when you go there. It's also in the Gospel Library app, under Gospel Topics, Church History. So, so they don't put question marks. They put it pretty definitively, but. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna see that it might not be so definitive, okay? So here we have this little bit of oh, uh, some congregational churches in New England called themselves by this same name, the Church of Christ, and professing Christians sometimes refer to themselves collectively as the Church of Christ. So to help the saints distinguish themselves from other Christians, according to this article, the elders at a conference voted to change the name Church of the Latter Day Saints. Now, there might be those of you out there that didn't grow up familiar with the idea that we were called the Church of Christ when it was uh, it restored and that it was called the Church of Latter-day Saints in 1834. I wasn't aware, and I actually saw one that grew up knowing a lot of things about church history, but that was something that I was just oblivious to. And then down here it says that they – see down here at the bottom – Besides lending clarity, the new name also distanced the church from the terms Mormon and Mormonite used by opponents of the church. That statement 
That statement is so funny. Changing the name of the church from Church of Christ to Church of Latter-day Saints distanced themselves from being called Mormons. And it worked. <laughs> I love it. It's hilarious. Okay. And then here it is. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 1838 to 1851. So we see here, okay, so we have the Revelation, section 115. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints referenced here, for thus shall my church be called. Right there. Right. And then why does it say till 1851? Well, it's a spelling thing. If we go to the next si slide, we have just a slight spelling difference. After Joseph's death, uh, we have all the offshoot groups that claim the term Latter-day Saints. And then uh, they started to change the spelling by about 1849, and they officially incorporated in 1851 in the territory or, or of Deseret as the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, where you have that uh, hyphen and lowercase d instead of the space. And that's that's what the rest of this article is covering. And then we have, at the end of the article, it says, 2001, the First Presidency reiterated the importance of using the church's revealed name as a part of our responsibility to proclaim the name of the Savior throughout the world. Well, we also have more recently with President Nelson reiterating that just a few years ago. Okay. Well, let's look here. Also in the Joseph Smith papers in the glossary, we have this definition of Church of Christ. And we have similar information here. A little bit, in, little bit additional. So we have the Book of Mormon relating that Christ set up his church in the Americas, Church of Christ. Okay, and then we have uh, the Church of Christ when it was first organized. Then we see here at May 1834, they changed the Church of Latter-day Saints. And then we have a revealed, uh, a revelation dated 26 April 1838. We have this statement from the Lord, for thus shall my church be called in the last, in the last days, even the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. And then we have this statement here that doesn't appear on the other article, usage during Joseph Smith's lifetime varied. And uh, that we're going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. Okay, so going through that narrative, going through that narrative, and I browse through it quickly, we have Church of Christ, 1829, Church of the Latter-day Saints, 1834, Missing the Name of Christ, and then allegedly 1838, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then a later incorporation that uh, standardized the spelling, 1851. Pretty simple. But it's the reasons for these that we want to look at closely, and we're going to learn some interesting things about it. But there's a lot of other questions that come up. Okay, why would Joseph Smith change the name of the church contrary to Jesus' statement in 3 Nephi 27? Is there any evidence to give other to give other reasons to the name change other than what the church offered in that article? Another question, why wasn't there a conference to accept the new name after 1838, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? We'll take a look at that. Why did Joseph Smith and others continue to use the name Church of the Latter-day Saints after 1838, while no one continued to use the name Church of Christ after the 1834 change, with just a couple of exceptions to that? Uh, then we have especially someone such as Governor of Illinois, Tom, Thomas Carlin, who would have only known it by the new name Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We will get to that. Here's a couple other questions. Why are there apparent unauthorized corrections to references to Church of Latter-day Saints in some records? Why are so many of our records handwritten copies of originals, but few originals? As we're going through Joseph Smith papers, um, that's what comes up almost uh, exclusively. Everything is a hand copy of original, but not very many originals. That's really important. Uh, they would have to make, they would have to have the original on hand in order to make a handwritten copy of the original. That's the irony of it. 
It's like, well, we lost the original. Well, how? You had it. You had to have it right there to make the hand copy, and those hand copies were made later. They were they were made later when you when you look at it. Last one. Why did the Lord threaten to reject the saints in 1841? So that's just a handful of questions. There's other questions. So why the name change in 1834? Let's look at a couple of these disputed reasons. So we have the official church stance. They did it to differentiate itself from other churches of the same name and also to distance itself from the term Mormon or Mormonite, according to the article. Uh, then we have the David Whitmer stance, which is kind of the fallen prophet or the least mistaken prophet stance where Joseph was mistaken or fallen. Um, and then it was Sidney Rigdon's idea. We'll take a look at that. And then thirdly, we have Lyman White's stance that the Lord did it as a consequence of the church's disobedience. So let's take a look at these because these are really interesting to consider when we're looking at all this history. So let's let's consider some of the apparent holes in the church's official stance. So there is little to no evidence to support it. There has so far been nowhere that I have found, and if any of you have found it, please send it to me, that anyone indicated that they wanted to change the name so that other people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't think that they were part of these other random Christian sects, right? I have, I've not found anything. To, so, so who invented that narrative? I don't know where that came from. I've not found any evidence. In addition, the church's own article quotes this bit from Third Nephi, and we're going to take a look at it. Because here it is, 7 through 12. Whatsoever you shall do, you shall do it in my name. Therefore, you shall call the church in my name. And you shall call upon the Father in my name, that he will bless the church for my sake. So from that one verse alone, Joseph, <laughs> he just translated this. <laughs> so, so if you're going to tell me that he just did it, to just do it, uh, seems really strange. And David Whitmer thought it was really strange too. He's like, uh, no, it was too obvious. The, the Book of Mormon was very clear. The Lord commanded us to do that, that which, uh, according to that which was written. And this was written very clearly and plainly. They all knew it. And then verse eight, how be it my church, save it be called in my name. That is a really interesting question. How be it my church, save it be called in my name. For if a church be called in Moses' name, then it be Moses' church. Or if it be called in the name of a man or group of men, then it be the church of a man or group of men, such as Latter-day Saints. But if it be called in my name, then it's my church. If it so be that they're built upon my gospel, I say unto you that you're built upon my gospel. Uh, scroll down. But if it be not built upon my gospel, verse 11, it is built upon the works of men or upon the works of the devil. Verily I say unto you, they have joined their works for a season, some un indeterminate amount of time. And by and by the end cometh, and they're hewn down and cast into the fire. For their works do follow them. It is because of their works they're hewn down. And that's interesting because that's end time context right there. So that's really, really curious. Uh, and then lastly, right here, we have this very casual approach to something that seems very adamant throughout all the writings and records between 1829 and 1834. And just a quick uh, look at that. So here, and, and this, is, this is where it's too long to spend a ton of time in, but as you go through the Book of Commandments and other revelations and, and letters, etc. So this was, that was the Articles of the Church. Um, we have just in those couple of revelations, so many references to this church of Christ. Uh, and it's usually this church of Christ, which is interesting. And not just the church of Christ. We have the church of Christ, this church of Christ. We see it here on the, you know, Book of Commandments when it was, when it was published for the government of the church of Christ. But it's it's so imbued everywhere in, in letters, in in all these revelations, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so the, to say to say very casually, well, 
you know, the Lord said, call it my name, but, you know, we wanted to differentiate ourselves from other Christians that were also saying Church of Christ. And that's, uh, it doesn't seem to hold merit when you hold it up to these other two points. Additionally, it doesn't follow to say we did it so they wouldn't cause Mormons anymore. And the article on the church website, interestingly, references an article in um, the Evening and Morning Star where they talk about being called Mormons and Mormonites and how they don't like that name and how they don't want to be called that. But that doesn't support the idea that if we change our name to Church of Latter-day Saints, they'll stop calling us Mormons. Maybe if we, you know, maybe if their name had been the Mormon Church and they changed it to Church of Latter-day Saints, that would work. But that's not what happened. So it's it's really curious there. Okay. So let's look just a little more into this. We have we have this statement that we just read, 27 verse 8 of 3rd Nephi. Let's look at it again. How be it my church, save it be called in my name. For if a church be called in Moses' name, then it's Moses' church called in the man's name, the man's church. Okay, well, let's cross-reference that. We have a couple of verses here. Alma 5, 38 to 39. And all this stuff is going to come into play when we look at some of the other uh, statements from this time period. So this is Alma. I say unto you that the good shepherd doth call you, yea, and in his own name he doth call you, which is the name of Christ. And if ye will not hearken unto the voice of the good shepherd, to the name by which you're called, behold, ye are not the sheep of the good shepherd. And now if ye are not the sheep of the good shepherd, of what fold are ye? The devil is your shepherd. That's pretty harsh pretty harsh words, but it's not too different when we're looking here in 3 Nephi. And he says, well, if you're not built upon my gospel, built upon the works of men or of the devil. Interesting, that one adds works of men, where Alma doesn't add, add that little bit. Okay, let's also cross-reference that here with 76. This is really key. Thanks to thanks to Mark for bringing this to my attention as we were talking about this. 98 through 100. And the glory of the telestial is one, even as the glory of the stars. Verse 99. For these of the telestial are they who are of Paul and of Paulos and of Cephas or of Moses, right? Verse 100. These are they who say some are of one, some of another, some of Christ, some of John, some of Moses, some of Elias, some of um, Isaiah, and some of Isaiah, and some of Enoch. These all tie together as we're painting this picture. Why Church of the Latter-day Saints? What happened? Well, let's look here. Section 109. This is the dedicatory prayer for the Kirtland Temple in 1836, which was after, um, about two years after the name change. Listen to this prayer from Joseph. Oh, hear, oh, hear, oh, hear us, oh, Lord, and answer these petitions and accept the dedication of this house, the Kirtland house, the Kirtland chapel, unto thee, the work of our hands, which we have built unto thy name, and right here, and also this church to put upon it thy name. And help us by the power of thy spirit, that we may mingle our voices with those bright shining seraphs, etc., etc., to put upon it thy name. So that suggests the Lord had something to do with it. Because if Joseph had just said, well, we're going to change it and take Christ's name out, why on earth would he pray and say, Christ, please put your name back? See, it doesn't follow. It just doesn't follow. It doesn't hold water. And how about this statement in section 124? This was given in um, January 1841 regarding this con uh, the command to construct the Nauvoo Temple. There's not a place found on earth that he, the Most High, may come to, to and restore again that which was lost unto you, or which he, God, hath taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. So here's a reference of the Lord at some point prior to 1841, taking something from the saints or telling the saints something that was lost unto them. And he says, even the fullness of the priesthood. So just from these two verses, we have the Lord's hand in something going on. 109, the name of Christ in the church. 124, the priesthood in the church. Let's look at 
David Whitner's explanation for just a second. His explanation is basically this idea of the fallen uh, prophet or the mistaken prophet motif. So it's it's not just, it's not his. He doesn't own this explanation, but uh, since since he's an eyewitness to the goings on, we're going to look at this. This is an address to all believers in Christ that he wrote. You see that 1887, right at the end of his life. So second to last page. Let's zoom in here for you. So he talks about this change, but he does it with a slightly different perspective of they shouldn't have done this. So right here on the title page of the Book of Commandments is Book of Commandments for the Government of the Church of Christ, all caps. On the title page of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was published in 1835, we have Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And the preface we have to members of the Church of Latter-day Saints. So as he goes on, he says, this was Sidney Rigdon's idea suggested to Joseph to change it, and Joseph shouldn't have done it. So this is 75 pages. You can come back and look at it. And, and this is the idea that Joseph made the decision. Again, uh, now he's, he doesn't say anything about the idea of, oh, trying to differentiate from other churches, etc. He's, he's more making the claim that Joseph was a fallen prophet because he eventually leaves the church. Uh, so it's similar to the church's explanation of, well, they just made the decision, but uh, they're offering slightly different reasons. Okay, now let's look at Lyman White's explanation, which is that the Lord, the Lord had a hand in it. So this is really interesting. In April 1837, three years after the name change, Church of Latter-day Saints, we have this. We have Lyman White on trial. This is in Missouri. David Patton preferred a charge against Lyman for teaching erroneous doctrines, which was investigated by the High Council at Far West. Uh, Seymour Bronson, George Dykes, uh, and others testified that Lyman said that we, the church, were under a telestial law. <laughs> a telestial law. What did we just read in section 76? Because God does not whip under a celestial law. <laughs> Therefore, so right there is an insinuation that he's that God was whipping the saints. Therefore, he took us, the church, out of doors to whip us. As a parent takes his children out of doors to chastise them. And that the book of Doctrine and Covenants was a telestial law, and the book of Commandments, Revelations printed in Jackson County, was a celestial law. The presidency decided, now this is the presidency of the area which consisted of David Whitmer, interesting, David Whitmer, uh, W.W. W. Phelps and John Whitmer, that presidency, not the presidency uh, of the Church of Joseph Smith uh, that, that he was part of. So the presidency of the area decided with the approbation of the council that Lyman had taught erroneously <laughs> and that he make an acknowledgement to the council and also go around and tell everyone everywhere that he had preached such abominable doctrine, signed Nathan West Clerk. Interesting. And uh, so you can take a look at that here from minute book two the joseph smith papers okay okay well let's let's go back and, and think about this how erroneous lyman may or may not have actually been so we have the plea from joseph lord put thy name upon this church 1836 and we have the links between section 76, Alma 5, and 3rd Nephi 27, without Christ's name, seems to make those of Apo Moses, of Apollos, of Paul, of, <laughs> of the Latter-day Saints could be submitted in there. Uh, so here we have section 84. Now we're going to look at this, section 84, which comes uh, out as a revelation in 1832. All right? And we're going to look at some of the stuff here. We're looking at scourge and judgment, bringing forth fruit. Let's take a look at this. So section 84, this is the famous revelation that the church under con is under condemnation. And I don't think uh, that the church by and large has interpreted it correctly. And the words in the revelation itself prove it. Everyone that hearkens to the voice of the Spirit comes unto God, even the Father. And the Father teaches him of the covenant 
which he has renewed or made new and conferred upon you. Look at that. Teaches him, the person that comes to God, teaches him of the covenant, which is confirmed upon you for your sakes. And not for your sakes only, for the sake of the whole world. What sake is this? We're going to see what sake. What sake? For your sakes. What sake? Verse 49, the whole world lies in sin and groans under darkness and under the bondage of sin. This is a word linked directly to Isaiah chapter 24, where you're going to look at that. So verse 49, mark note, make note. Bondage of sin, groans under darkness, lies in darkness. Verse 50, and by this you may know that they're under the bondage of sin. They don't come unto me. For whoso comes not unto me is under the bondage of sin. This is so clear. And whoso receives not my voice is not acquainted with my voice and is not of me. And by this you may know the righteous from the wicked and that the whole world groans under sin and darkness even now. And your minds, saints, in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all the whole church. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments, which I have given them, not only to say, but to do, according to that which I have written. That, the that is so important because the that is the whole point. This is for your sakes. In order that, so that. <laughs> for the purpose of that they may bring forth fruit meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, if they don't, there remains a scourge and judgment to be poured upon, out upon the children of Zion. And then right here, for shall the children of Zion pollute my holy land? I say unto you, nay, all of the clues are in this passage. And I'm going to tell them to you right now, and then we're going to look at it. So we already looked. We have the covenant. He made very clear we need to come unto God. How do you come unto God? Well, with this covenant that I've renewed in this day. Um, but you haven't done it. So until you remember this renewed covenant. And then here's what's interesting. Even the Book of Mormon. So people think, oh, this means we need to read the Book of Mormon. No, this is a misunderstanding, and it's likely due to a scribal error even in the Book of Mormon. Because if we think of what a covenant is, according to what verse 58 and 59 say, and what the verses above it say, a covenant has to do with what God promises us if we do our end. So the two-way promise, right? God promises it to us if we do our end. The Book of Mormon was not a promise. The saints just got it. And he already explained what this new covenant is. It's the renewed covenant from times of old. So... The Book of Mormon, then, why does he say the Book of Mormon? Well, because the Book of Mormon directs us right to that promise. And that promise, pollute my holy land, the bondage of sin, being unclean, to pollute being in sin. So we're going to look at this idea of being sanctified and what it takes to be sanctified so you can't pollute the Lord's holy land. And that is, at the essence of the new covenant, this renewed covenant. And then, again, verse 58, to bring forth fruit. What is this fruit? Okay, what is this fruit? So so here is this idea. Uh, let's move forward for just a second. Because before we go into some of those other uh, word links, we're going to look at this from the Book of Commandments, chapter 4. Book of Commandments is in chapters. Book of Commandments, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6. Uh you see the notes here, it was section 32 in the first edition of Doctrine and Covenants, and it was reprinted as section 5 in our current edition. However, these two verses aren't in our edition. Why not? Let's read them. And thus, this is 1829, and thus if the people of this generation harden not their hearts, this is talking about, this is talking about the members of the church. I will work a reformation among them, and I will put down all lyings and deceivings and priestcrafts and envyings and stripes and idolatries and sorceries and all manner of iniquities, and I will establish my church like unto the church which was taught by my disciples in the days of old, which was the church of Christ. And now if this generation do harden their hearts against my word, behold, I will deliver them up unto Satan 
for he reigneth and hath much power at this time, for he hath not great hold upon the hearts of the people of this generation, and not far from the iniquities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do they come at this time? And behold, the sword of justice hangs over their heads. And if they persist in the hardness of their hearts, the time comes that must fall upon them. Behold, I tell you these things, even as I told the people of the destruction of Jerusalem, and my word shall be verified at this time, as it hath hitherto been verified. This is packed with so much. We have, I will work a reformation. It doesn't say restoration, it says reformation. That's interesting, because that that potentially hints at this idea of the church falling. And the Lord's saying, well, if you don't harden your hearts, because in section 84, he says, well, your hearts have been hardened. It's like, I'll work a reformation and answer that plea. Lord, put your church back, put your name back on this church. Excuse me. And then the next verse, verse six, look at this. Even as I told people of the destruction of Jerusalem, he's saying, I'm giving you a warning before certain destruction. Repent. Such an interesting prophecy that's not in our section five that was in section or chapter four of Book of Commandments. Here's a letter to W.W. Phelps. See the date here? Important correspondence with the brethren in Zion. So Joseph from Kirtland writes a letter to W.W. Phelps in Zion or Missouri, January 1833. So short time after the section 84, 1832 uh, condemnation revelation. Brother Phelps, I send you the olive leaf, which was section 88. Or is section 88, excuse me. I send you the olive leaf, which we have plucked from the tree of paradise, the Lord's message of peace to us. For though our brethren in Zion indulge in feelings towards us, which are not according to the requirements of the new covenant. The requirements of the new covenant. The new, that's exactly why the new covenant isn't the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon doesn't have requirements. It's a book. The new covenant has requirements because a covenant is the two-way promise where the Lord promises something and requires something of us in order to get it. The requirements of the new covenant, yet we have the satisfaction of knowing that oh, move. that the Lord approves of us and has accepted us and established his name in Kirtland for the salvation of the nations, for the Lord will have a place whence his word will go forth in these last days in purity. And then look right here. For if Zion will not purify herself so as to be approved of in all things in his sight, he will seek another people. Okay? That should be highlighted. Let's highlight that. He will seek another people. For his work will go on until Israel is gathered. And they who will not hear his voice must expect to feel his wrath. Let me say unto you, seek to purify yourselves and also all the inhabitants of Zion. There it is again. Seek, therefore, seek to purify yourselves. Purify yourselves. That's going to lead right up to what this covenant's all about. Lest the Lord's anger be kindled to fierceness. Listen to this. It's a progression. See that progression right there? Lest the Lord's anger be kindled to fierceness. He's already mad, and that's why they're under condemnation. Don't let it get fierce, though. So purify yourselves. Repent, repent is the voice of God to Zion, to the Latter-day Saints. Repent. You're not repenting. And strange as it may appear, yet it is true. Mankind will persist in self-justification <laughs> until all their iniquities exposed and their character past being redeemed and that which is treasured up in their hearts be exposed to the gaze of mankind. I say to you, and what I say to you, I say to all. Hear the warning voice of God, lest Zion fall. And the Lord swear in his wrath, the inhabitants of Zion shall not enter into his rest. There's another link to section 84 that had the condemnation. We're going to look at that. J Joseph is saying, look, make sure you heed the Lord's warning voice. He's already warned you saying you're under condemnation. He's So that's... Condemnation means his anger is kindled against you. Don't let it get kindled unto fierceness, though, and purify yourselves and repent. Because if you don't, the Lord might swear in his wrath that the inhabitants of Zion shall not enter into his rest. That phrase comes right out of the revelation on the condemnation, which we were going to look at. So, making sure we understand the new covenant. 
uh, we have some other sections we can look at. Section 45, I've sent the everlasting covenant into the world. Come ye unto it. Section 101, 39, the everlasting gospel, comma, my everlasting covenant. So it's the essence of the gospel. The everlasting covenant is the essence of the gospel. We're going to look at that. We're going to see that here in just a second. And section 133, fullness of his gospel, his everlasting covenant. So he's defining what this... Ever, so everlasting means it's from way back when to way forever. That's why the Lord says, the covenant which I've renewed unto you in section 84 that we read. So here's here's Isaiah 24 that I mentioned that links right with section 84. You've broken the everlasting covenant. Let's take a look at that. The earth also is defiled on the inhabitants thereof. This is verbiage that the Lord used in section 84. We just read it. Because they've transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Wow. Okay. So then it says, come ye unto it. And, and section 84 talked about that. Come unto me. Abide by this new covenant. So how do you come into the fullness of the gospel? How do you receive it? The Lord says, do it so that you can bring forth fruit. So what covenant exactly, this two-way promise the requirements of this new covenant. Well, 3 Nephi 9, verse 20. And that's not the only place. It's all over in scriptures, but this is so blatant. Now, let's start a couple verses back. As many as have received me, or come unto me, like section 84 says, to them have I given to become the sons of God, sons of daughters. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh. In me the law of Moses is fulfilled. 19, offer no more the shedding of blood. So the law of, law of those uh, temporal sacrifices is done away. But verse 20, but you shall offer for a sacrifice. This is your end, our end. You shall offer for a sacrifice, broken heart and a contrite spirit. The Lord is establishing a covenant here. And this is all throughout the scriptures from the beginning of time with Adam all the way till now, making it everlasting and thus renewed, new and everlasting. Sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso comes unto me with a broken heart and contrite spirit, here's my end. I'll baptize with fire with the Holy Ghost, even as the Lamanites. Because of their faith in me, time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. Therefore, verse 22, whoso repenteth and cometh unto me. So he's saying, therefore, that's a summary. So this is how we repent and come unto him. Section 84, that, that verbiage, that's kind of how we repent and come unto him. So linking all this stuff together, it goes hand in hand in hand in hand from one piece to another. So we offer a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Christ offers to make us his sons and daughters through the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. That's how he sanctifies us. If we had more time, we can go into more of those scriptures, but we don't. But that's the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost sanctifies us. So we have uh, purify yourselves. Shall the children of Zion pollute my holy land? I say unto you, nay. That was from section 84. How about this? From Millennial Star, we come to this standard. We're going to look at what Millennial Star says. So how do we come to the fullness of the gospel? How do we come to the new covenant or into the church of Christ? Baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. So those who have taken upon them his name or become his sons and his daughters, the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. Well, let's look at this. In the millennial star, we have this critique of the church and of the saints. Were the saints actually receiving the fullness of the gospel slash church of Christ slash receiving the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost? Let's take a look real quick. So I, I uh, had to hand type this out, but this is straight from the Millennial Star, Volume 4, August 1843. So 10 years later, so this is 10 years later. The saints have had 10 years to try and do these things. And 10 years later, Thomas Ward, uh, who I believe mission president over England and also editor of the Millennial Star at this time, he makes some connections again to Section 84, the gift of the Holy Ghost stands preeminently distinguished as the greatest gift that man can receive or be a deity bestow. To pos the possession of this gift, which is the power of godliness from section 84, we'll be looking at that again, 
The possession of the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the power of godliness, is what constitutes the special difference between the church of the living God and everybody else on the earth. So if you don't have the actual gift of the Holy Ghost, then you actually aren't in the church of the living God. And there's plenty of scriptures to show that. Now look at this. We'll skip down. Now, if we ask the question, have we yet attained to this standard? Surely the universal answer would be we have not, especially when we closely examine the nature of it, the nature of the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's the indictment from, <laughs> from Thomas Ward, Mr. President, uh, serving in England at the time, and, and editor of the Millennial Star. So that's his observation from 10 years later. Universally, no, he says, we have not attained to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which means haven't received Christ, haven't become his sons and daughters, haven't been purified, haven't actually entered into the Church of Christ. So Lyman's reasoning starts to have a lot of merit, much more merit than the other two explanations have. Uh, so now we're going to just double check real quick. In section 84, the come ye unto this everlasting covenant, as God says, this power of godliness, which is the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then the phrase where Joseph seems to be referencing that... Uh, well, don't let God swear in his wrath that the children of Zion shall not enter into his rest. So let's take a look at that real quick. Isn't this, isn't this exciting? This is like, oh my gosh, the condemnation that they were under, and that condemnation starts here in 1832 with the revelation of section 84. It starts here. Now, according to President Benson, uh, Elder Oaks, then Elder Oaks, um, uh, President Nelson. They still say, oh, we're still under this condemnation. But as they talk about it, they refer to it having to do with reading the Book of Mormon and being more dedicated to read the Book of Mormon. So the members of the church think that that's it. And it's like, well, how much Book of Mormon do we have to read to get out of this condemnation? Well, it's looking like that's not what it is. So here's the big, towards the beginning of 84. And this greater priesthood administers the gospel. Admit This greater priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, administers the gospel. It gives the gospel to people and holds the keys of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key of knowledge of God. Therefore, in the ordinances thereof of the gospel, here it is, in the ordinances of the gospel, the gift of the Holy Ghost is manifest, the power of godliness. And without the ordinances thereof, and the authority of the higher priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the power of godliness, is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without the gift of the Holy Ghost, being purified, being sanctified, becoming the son or daughter of Christ, all those things, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. And Moses plainly taught this. He tried to, there it is, sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. But they harden their hearts. This is exactly what the Lord says in verses uh, 47 to 58. They harden their hearts and would, could not endure his presence. So the Lord in his wrath, this is what Joseph was quoting in his letter to W.W. W. Phelps. The Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them. This is what he's quoting. Swore they should not enter into his rest while they were tarried in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of his glory. So the so Joseph says, listen, you guys need to repent and purify yourselves. You don't want God's anger to be kindled unto fierceness. So it's talking about degrees. It's talking about progression, progression or progressive anger or progressive condemnation. Because you're already under condemnation. You already have anger. Don't let it progress further. Lest the Lord should swear that the children of Zion should not enter into his rest. So what is entering into the Lord's rest? Well, without going into tons of detail, this has to do with Obviously, seeing the face of God, verse 22 and 23, which is his presence, verse 24, which he's clarifying is entering into his rest, which is all over in the scriptures. And he clarifies entering into the fullness of his glory is what it really means. While in the wilderness for the children of Israel, in other words, during our lives. So Joseph is saying, look, you better repent, lest the Lord swear that none of you shall uh, enter into the fullness of his glory in this life and see his face. And as consequence, he took Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood. Boom, boom. And the lesser priesthood continued, which is the priesthood of Aaron, which uh, holds the 
preparatory gospel, key of the preparatory gospel. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Which gospels? Gospel of repentance and baptism, remission of sins, etc., etc. Okay. Well, let's look at when the Kirtland Temple is dedicated, 1836. We get section 110, which is the revelation where Elijah, Elias, Moses come to the Kirtland Temple. Jesus comes to them. And we have this amazing experience now, but the church already lost its name, seemingly, or changed its name, whichever narrative you want to lean into, changed its name or lost the name of Christ. They don't have it back yet. Joseph just dedicated the temple, crying out for Christ to give them his name back to the church. And in the midst of that, we have this. After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and our seed, all generations should be blessed. So we have now we have a couple of different terms. When was the last time you were taught that there were different gospels? Because just now we already know we have fullness of the gospel. Then we just read preparatory gospel. And then we just read Gospel of Abraham. There's a reason to believe that those are the two same things. And the reason to uh, see that is the pattern given in section 84 of what happened. And they didn't repent. And what happened as a result, they were given this. Well, if the saints went under that same condemnation, then they would have been given the preparatory gospel as a result. And the Lord would have taken his priesthood out of their midst. Notice in section 124, we looked at this idea of the Lord saying, well, he took the priesthood away. So that's matching section 84, what we just read. And then here it is, Elias appearing and says, here's the gospel of Abraham. So now we have two phrases that seem to coincide, the preparatory gospel and the gospel of Abraham, uh, as a result of them not repenting. Okay, so, there, so there's the summary. What, what, what are you going to believe what is there any more evidence? Am, are we missing something? If you ever find something, make sure to send it to me because I have a hard time buying into the narrative uh, in the article from the church or I, I don't I don't believe uh, David Whitmer's approach because I, I do believe that Joseph was a true prophet until he died throughout his whole life. And I don't believe that he just changed it. So we have the Lord's name taken away, apparently the fullness of the gospel, and they're given the preparatory gospel, and the priesthood, just as section 84 warned. So here's the question then, and this is a key question that we have to ask ourselves and consider. Did the Lord put his name back on the church? And it would seem yes, or at least maybe. <laughs> Section 115, for thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we get this revelation in 1838, so two years after the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Verily I say unto you, arise and shine forth, that they that thy light may be a standard for the nations. That's what he said in section 45. That the gathering together upon land of Zion upon her stakes may be for a defense and a refuge from the storm. And from wrath, when it shall be poured out without mixture. that's That sounds like an end-time context, interestingly. Now, in Joseph's day, a lot of them believed they were in the end-time context, just like a lot of the saints during uh, Peter, James, John, Paul, as they were preaching, thought they were at the end times. But obviously, they weren't in the exact end times. Not yet. And a lot of us believe right now that we're right on the edge of it. So here we have this end-time context. Zion wasn't a defense and a refuge for the saints. Why not? That's the question, because it wasn't. But the Lord promised it would be. But what did he tell them? I say to you, arise and shine forth that thy light may be a standard for the nations. That's a link to coming into the new covenant from those other verses. And I know we're moving fast. If we had more time, we could dive more into all of those links there. So, verse 8, therefore I command you to build a house unto me. Now, this is going to link into section 124 when we come back to it. Build a house unto me for the gathering together of my saints that they may worship me. Thus let them from that time forth, skipping down, this is just a, a selection, 
uh, labor diligently until it shall be finished. Listen to this. From the cornerstone thereof to the top thereof until there shall not anything remain that's not finished. He's very clear about this. And this is important to remember as we look to section 124 later. And if my people build it not according to the pattern, which I show to the presidency, I will not accept it at their hands. Okay, let's remember verse 12 and 15 later. So section 115, let's remember verse 12 and verse 15 later. The next question, was there a conference held? Because we have the a conference or general meeting of the formal acceptance of the Church of Christ in 1830. We have the conference in May 1834, Church of the Latter-day Saints. Do we have a conference where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was accepted by the church? That's a, it's a good question. It's a good question, and it's an important question. Because here, as we're looking at the changes of the name of the church, the church voted in a general conference in May 1834 to change the name to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. This was published in the Evening and Morning Star, Volume 2, Number 20, also referenced in History of the Church, Volume 2 by B.H. Roberts. And here are the minutes. Minutes of a conference of elders of the Church of Christ. So as they gathered, they gathered as the Church of Christ. Which church was organized April 1830. And then President Smith was chosen moderator. Uh, Frederick D. Williams, Oliver Cowdery appointed clerks. After prayer, the conference proceeded to discuss the subject of names and appellations when a motion was made by Sidney Rigdon and seconded by Whitney, Newell K. Whitney, that this church be known hereafter by the name of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Remarks were made by the members after which the motion passed by unanimous vote. Resolved that this conference recommend to the conferences and churches abroad that in making out and transmitting minutes of their proceedings, such minutes and proceedings be made out under the above title, Church of the Latter-day Saints. Resolved that these minutes be signed by moderator and clerks published in Evening Morning Star, uh, J. Smith, F. Williams, O. Caldry. So, What's interesting is that these minutes don't have the details <laughs> of what they talked about. <laughs> the remarks were made, uh, discussed the subject of names and appellations, and then boom, let's change it. So too bad we don't have that at our disposal uh, to look at. So now we're going to look at this idea of holding a conference for accepting the name Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because why is it important? Well, because everything's supposed to be done by the voice of the church and common consent. Look at just just in uh, the revelations from, uh, these are also from Book of Commandments, but they're also in our current Doctrine and Covenants. Here's three sections right here, by common consent, done in order, and by common consent, only by the voice and common consent of the order. Go, uh, moving on, verse, section 38, shall be appointed by voice of the church. Section 41, shall be appointed by the voice of the church. Section 102, acknowledged in his administration by the voice of the church. It was something that they practiced very diligently. All of the minutes and uh, all of the conferences, they voted or rather received or accepted by vote everything, including little details. Little details such as, here's something fun. Here in, <laughs> this, this, is, this is why it boggles my mind that, uh, that we don't have the details of, of this supposed conference. Here is, voted by a general conference of the ordained members, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that all licenses hereafter should be signed by one of the first uh, presidency of the church and president of general recorder as clerk, and all others, of course, be con considered fraud after this date. These are licenses uh, such as so-and-so was ordained uh, elder to the church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that's what this license book is. Uh, right here, here's the license to whom it concern certifies that Benjamin L. Clapp has been received to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized, etc., etc., 
given by the direction of a general conference, et cetera, et cetera, signed Joseph Smith, uh, George Robinson, Recorder General. So, so here is an example of they made a small little change. Okay, all of our licenses have to have this signature. Otherwise, it's going to be considered fraud after this date. Uh, uh, the signature of, the pres of someone from the presidency of the church. So that's a really interesting thing to know. And there are, there are dozens, hundreds of examples of this type of action done in the minutes and conferences of the church. So that's why this is significant. Because they did it by the voice of the church in everything. And we saw that in 1834. They changed the name for whatever reason. Looks like the Lord took it out. But the church still accepted it. The Lord commanded his church be called the Church of Christ in 1829. They still formally met to organize and accept it in 1830. So, that okay, let's skip ahead then to some of the legal actions that were made to incorporate the name of the church formally in the state of Illinois. We have a bill to incorporate the church, and we have this appointment of Joseph Smith as trustee of the church, and we'll see how that's significant. So, the bill to incorporate the church. This is in John Bennett's handwriting. We'll talk about why that's significant in just a second. It mentions the need for the church to hold a meeting. Interesting, huh? Look at this. Here is from the bill. The officers and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly called Mormons, are hereby created, constituted, and declared to be a body corporate and politic with perpetual succession. With all and singular, the powers, privileges, prerogatives of a corporation by the name of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The first presidency of which, in conjunction with the general assembly of said church or the general conference of said church, shall constitute the law-making department of the corporation. So there it is reiterated again in this bill. For all secular purposes, with full power and authority to do all such acts as they may consider necessary for the welfare and prosperity of said church, and the said first presidency and their successors in office shall be trustees and trust for the church. And then here's section two. The corporators herein named, uh, which I, I didn't include on this slide, herein named shall meet at the city of Nauvoo on the fourth day of July next, which would be 1841. For the purpose of organization, this act shall take effect and be in force from and after said day. That's really interesting. So it reiterates that need. So this was written and submitted by John C. Bennett, which is a little suspicious. Here is from his own word. So those who don't know about John Bennett, he was an imposter. He came in, rose really fast in the city of Nauvoo to mayor, rose really fast in the church to the first presidency, uh, betrayed Joseph on numerous occasions, all sorts of stuff, such a mess. So here's from his own account. It's, of course, necessary for me to give some explanation of the reasons which led me to join the Mormons. Skip down. Uh, the opinion of those who have heard of me in the eastern part of the U.S. that I unified to the Mormons from a conviction of the truth. No, that was a gross error. Not true. I never believed in them or their doctrines. So we see here in this next paragraph that he was noticing and wording that the Mormons were going to basically overtake everything. You know, and so that he wanted to get in and expose it and help bring it down. So if we skip down where it's highlighted. So this determined me to make an attempt to detect and expose the movers and machinery of the plot. I perceived that I would be useless to undertake this by open opposition. It at length occurred to me that the surest and speediest way to overthrow the imposter, J. Smith, and expose his iniquity to the world would be to profess myself a convert to his doctrines and join him at the seat of his dominion, which he certainly did at the seat of the first presidency. So here we have um, now Joseph Smith's appointment as trustee to the county recorder. Hang on, I'm going to... Just shrink this for a second. 
to the county recorder of the county county of hancock dear sir at a meeting here's a reference to a meeting of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints at this place on saturday 30 of january 1841 i was the elected sole trustee for said church to hold my office during life invested with plenary powers as sole trustee and trust for the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints etc etc uh this is agreeable very end agreeable to the provisions of an act entitled an act concerning religious societies that was approved by the state of illinois in 1835 signed joseph smith well this is that um record from the county clerk's office okay and we have the law that he's referring to the act concerning religious societies we have that law right here and this is going to point out some interesting things so section two of this act of con pertaining to religious societies Listen to this. A immediately after the election or appointment of trustees by any society or congregation, as aforesaid, the persons elected or appointed, so Joseph, should make a certificate under his hand and seal. Number one, stating the date of their election or appointment. And two, that shall be verified by affidavit by some one of the persons making the same. And then three, shall be recorded by the recorder of the county. Well, that's what this is. This is number three. This is in the hand. This is this is from the county records in the hand of the county clerk. That's number three. So that means we're missing number one and two. We don't have a certificate under Joseph's hand with a seal stating the same thing. And we don't have an affidavit. So again, both of these attempts to supposedly incorporate legally with the state, the name Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, have some peculiar holes in them. And here is uh, just a snapshot from that uh, piece of legislation. I pulled, it took me a lot of time, but I found this from the laws of the state of Illinois, 1834, 1835. So there's that little bit that we just quoted. So let's look at this possible conference that was held. Voice of the Church, common consent. So maybe they did it. So from the church history, we have 26 January 1841, which is Tuesday, not the 30th, at a special conference of the church, Latter-day Saints held in Nauvoo, pursuant to public notice, I, Joseph Smith, was unanimously elected sole trustee and trust for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then the 30th and 31st was a conference at Walnut Grove, Knox County, Illinois, Elder William Smith presiding, 113 members, 14 elders, several branches represented, several persons baptized. So here, here's where it gets interesting. So here is B.H. Roberts' History of the Church. That entry is all under the 30th at a special conference on the 30th. And that would match what Joseph said. But the, but the Joseph Smith Papers document makes it look like the 26th. So we are going to examine that. I'm going to pull that up right here for you to look at and why it seems to be peculiar. I hope you all find this as interesting as me. So here it is. It's from, this is from History of the Church. So this is uh, where B.H. Roberts gets History of the Church. This is from these volumes that aren't primary sources. So you have primary sources and secondary sources. R remember, primary source means from exactly where it came from. So in ex an example of a primary source for what we just read would be the actual copy of the actual minutes of the actual conference. So the minutes that we looked at from the 1834 Church of Latter-day Saints, that was a secondary source uh, because it wasn't from the actual minutes. It was minutes that were copied into the Evening and Morning Star uh, publication and published out. So that's a secondary source. Um, this is definitely a secondary source and less credible because it's like, well, where did the primary source come from? So take a look here. I'm going to zoom in. 
Take a look at this. So the 30th of January, we have the record that I just read. Then look at this curious insertion. This is all over in a lot of records. Really curious insertions. The special conference, blah, 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 blah. It's like, oh, well, that, that, that event had to happen right here because Joseph said it did. But then it's noted as 26. Those are all references to dates. 24, 21. So 21, 24. And on the 26th, this little blip at a special conference, blah, 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 blah. Isn't that curious? It's beyond curious. It's suspicious. There it is. So there's, there, there it is zoomed in. Now, again, this is not an original record. It's a handwritten uh, version of history that they were getting from wherever they were getting it from. And on the in the Joseph Smith papers, at the top of every page, it says source note. When that source note tells you whose handwriting is it in, where it came from, blah, blah, blah. And almost every single page of all of Joseph Smith papers is a copy of the original, not the actual original, which is, again, curious because if someone's hand copying it, they could change it. So let's say that the church then changed its name because there's a lot of usage to indicate that they did. So many people use the name Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If that's the case, why did Joseph and others, including prominent others, continue to use the name Church of the Latter-day Saints after 1838? And notice but no one continued to use Church of Christ after the 1834 change, with just a couple exceptions. And I mean, so far, it's been just a couple, somewhere between three and five out of the hundreds of references to Church of Latter-day Saints that exist. So we have the conference in 1834, and we read the minutes of the conference, and it says, make sure you use this new name in all of your designations hereafter, Church of the Latter-day Saints. And they did. And a couple of times, people said, Church of Christ or Church of Christ, comma, Church of Latter-day Saints, but almost, almost exclusively Church of Latter-day Saints. So why then, after the 1838 revelation, they continue to say Church of Latter-day Saints so often? Not to mention that the church says that it was changed to Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the revelation of 1838. Interesting. Now, the Lord did say, thus shall my church be called in the last days which is slightly different than the way he said these last days when he established the Church of Christ, these last days versus the last days. And section 115 had end time context verbiage. Anyway, that's curious, but I digress. Let's look at some of these examples. This is post section 115, which is that revelation in April 1838 that says, my church shall be called Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. Here's some evidences, just a few. There's a bunch. Here's affidavit from Joseph Smith, 5th of September of that same year. Um, the Mormons, so-called, and it's crossed out in the document, Church of the Latter-day Saints. And we can just you can take a look at that affidavit here, right there in the middle. Church of the Latter-day Saints, Mormons, so-called, Church of Latter-day Saints. Interesting. There's a zoom in on it. So right here, Church of Latter-day Saints, 1838. Joseph Smith. How about Joseph Smith's letter from Liberty Jail? And there he did. There's three letters where it have this reference. I just included one to the Church of Latter Day Saints in Caldwell County, December 1838. Now, one of the letters he uses both designations: Church of Latter Day Saints and Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. But since so many say it did happen, and we have a lot of designations in a lot of or a lot of references rather to the designation Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. That's not the question. The question is, why are people still using this other name? So here it is. There's a close-up. This one's curious. John Taylor, written letter to the editor to the Quincy Argus in May 1839. So over a year after this revelation. John Taylor, one of the twelve. And he refers to it twice. All of the references in this brief letter to the editor say Church of Latter-day Saints. Which immoralities the Church of Latter-day Saints is liable to be charged with. Written and signed in behalf of the Church of Latter-day Saints by your very humble servant, John Taylor. 
Look at this one. Be it remembered that I, George Robinson, agent and attorney, in fact, for the Church of Latter-day Saints. He's the agent and attorney. This is a legal document. Do hereby acknowledge that I am bound to Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Jr., Hiram Smith to perform all duties of my agency. He's bound to the First Presidency as the uh, agent and attorney. Here's a quick look at that one. And this is a ruffled up document. It's got some holes in it. 30 April 1839, one year later, and the this legal representative of the church, this legal representative of the church, that's what this document is about. He's legally representing them to purchase land. He's calling it the Church of Latter-day Saints. So curious. There it is again, close up. How about this? The former or ex-governor of Illinois, Thomas Carlin. So this is 1843. Carlin was governor of Illinois from 38 to 42. That was his four-year stint. Well, that supposedly is when the church had its name changed that whole time. So the, in his entire governorship was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and then here it is the year afterwards. And here's this is a letter. Mr. Prent, uh, Mr. Prentice in the vicinity of Quincy said that some person in high standing in the Church of Latter-day Saints, in this place, Nauvoo, had an interview with you, slash being meaning me, said he would use all the influence that his circumstances would admit of to have J. Smith arrested and delivered in the hands of Missourians, etc. I have always looked upon you as one of the most devoted followers of Joseph Smith, this is to Sidney Rigdon, and one of the pillars of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. I never sought through the aid of any person to entrap Joseph Smith. Here's a quick look at that. Now, notice, see this reference right here? It's from Journal December 1842. So this isn't the actual original letter. And so you click the source note here and it tells you whose handwriting this is in, et cetera, et cetera. Here is from resolutions in December 1843, drafted by Phelps and Reynolds Cahoon and Hosea Stout. Whereas the state of Missouri, with the governor at the head, continues to make demands upon the executive of Illinois for the body of General Joseph Smith, as we very believe to keep up a system of persecution against the Church of Latter-day Saints. Unconstitutional warfare against said Church of Latter-day Saints, which he has practiced during the last 12 years. Here it is, uh, Minutes of the High Council from Minute Book 2. Look at this, June 1st, 1844, right at the very end of Joseph's life. The High Council of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Met at the 70s Hall. Agreeable to German, 1st of June, etc., etc. President, stake president, William Marks. Right? Here's a look at that. So, the High Council of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Right at the very end of Joseph's life. Here's a close-up. Church of Latter-day Saints. So, real quick. So as we consider this, is it, again, is it definitive? It's not definitive, but the idea is to collect as much of this information as possible so we can get as clear a picture as possible. So we have tons of usages of Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from 1838 until Joseph's death and obviously beyond. That's not the question. Uh, the question is, why so many references to Church of Latter-day Saints? That was just a few, but I tried to pick some really prominent ones, uh, either prominent people or prominent types of documents. And there are other uh, legal records that have it as well. So why, why would that be the case? So if the Lord put his name back on the church, then we have this idea of 1838, Lord puts his name back. 1841, Joseph Smith becomes appointed trustee in trust officially if we accept that document and we accept that supposed conference in that book that we saw the uh, notes on. Uh, and that was at the end of January. So that means we have to go back to section 124 with the revelation given in January 1841, same month, only 10 days prior. So we're going to go right back to that. So January 19, 1841. 
section 124. We were looking at this earlier, verse 28. The Lord is saying he needs to restore again what was lost to the saints, or what he'd taken away, even the funnels of the priesthood. And then he goes on saying, this is why the house is needed. We need a baptismal font to do baptism for the dead, because it belongs in the temple. Um, so, verse 31, but I command you, all my saints, to build a house unto me. Now, this really similar to the command that we read in section 115. Remember I said to remember verse 12 from section 115 when he gave him these specific commandments for building the house. And I grant unto you a sufficient time to build a house, verse 31. And during this time, your baptisms shall be acceptable unto me. What baptisms? Well, they were asking if they could do them in the river in the meantime because they were so excited about this new doctrine. And so the Lord is saying, yeah, during this appointment, I will let them be uh, done in the river. But, af but after this appointment, verse 32, at the end of this appointment, your baptisms for your dead in that you're doing in the river shall not be acceptable to me. And if you do not these things, at the end of the appointment, ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead. Say the Lord your God. Okay, let's back up again just a quick second. Let's review some of this stuff. In 1832, they had come under condemnation. We read one example of the letter from Joseph Smith. Whoop, sorry. One example letter from Joseph Smith to W.W. W. Phelps and the church in Missouri, in Zion, that to beware lest the Lord would increase his anger to fierceness. And so they need to repent as a result to, to avoid that, right? But as a result of not repenting, the Lord takes his name out of the church. At least what it seems to be. And he also takes his priesthood out of the church. So that means his anger did escalate. That means they did progress from condemnation to more severe condemnation or covenant curse, because they were not coming under the covenant for covenant blessings, which blessing is the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost to be purified, to be the sons and daughters of Christ. So they added covenant curse instead. That's the progression. That's the progression. So that did happen. Well, if they progressed in the Lord's anger to fierceness and lost his name in the church and his priesthood. And then 1841, they've had his name back. That means they're supposedly back in his good graces for those three years. Why would the Lord threaten to reject the entire church? Because that would be yet another escalation. That would be another escalation, another progression of this anger. You didn't do it. You need to do this. Here's a warning. Okay, you didn't do it. Follow through. Bam. Consequence. And then here's another warning. And here's another consequence. Rejection. So that's that's a question. If the Lord had given his blessing back to the people, why, why would this come out of the blue like that? That would be like one step forward, two steps back. You came back, but now I'm going to just reject you because you won't get this house built in time. Not to mention, to consider, two years after this was that article written in the Millennial Star by Thomas Ward saying, the church still has not come under the standard of receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which means they haven't come under the standard of the everlasting gospel, which is the everlasting covenant. To repent, turn to the Lord, offer a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Isn't that curious? So what would that mean for us today then? Well, it goes back to that revelation. It's like, well, that revelation of uh, section four that we looked at, or chapter four, which is now section five, and those verses that weren't in there, and the letter from Joseph to W.W. W. Phelps saying, well, if they don't repent, then the Lord will seek another people. Isn't that interesting? So this threat to reject the church is pretty serious. And we're going to read here. Uh, just a couple of interesting quotes so that we can think about, okay, how, how then does this condemnation that 
President Benson said we're still under, but he said we weren't reading the Book of Mormon enough. And uh, Al Drokes, President Nelson said the same thing. Uh, it's so interesting as you look at it and say, okay, no, it has nothing to do with reading the Book of Mormon. It has to do with not only to say, but also to do. Well, if we say, I take upon myself the name of Christ, but we don't do it and don't actually uh, take upon us the name of Jesus Christ, then, then we're not fulfilling that. Not only to say, but also to do. Right? So let's read this then. We read Lyman White earlier who said the church had fallen under a telestial law. And we looked at that. So it's interesting that we're going to come back to Lyman White regarding this appointment to build a temple and how important it is. Here we go. And this is a letter that he wrote, which a manuscript is in the hands of the RLDS Church. So we're going to read this selection here about this command to build the temple. So this is a letter written in December 1851. So we quote from the manuscript of the letter. So he says the church mostly went from Kirtland to Missouri, where they commenced another house from which they were driven to the state of Illinois. So they only commenced that far west temple, didn't ever finish it. Where we were commanded to build a house or temple, the Most High God, we were to have a sufficient time to build that house. As the Lord said, I give you a certain amount of time, during which time our baptisms for our dead should be acceptable in the river. If we did not build within this time, we were to be rejected as a church, we and our dead together. Both the temple and baptizing went very leisurely. Doesn't sound very earnest, does it? Till the temple was somewhere in building the second story when Brother Joseph from the stand announced the alarming declaration that baptism for our dead was no longer acceptable in the river. And so Lyman puts two and two together here, as much as to say the time for building the temple had passed by, and both we and our dead were rejected together. Brother Joseph then called all councils together and chose what we called a grand council of 50 persons, himself and counselors among the rest, also the 12. More than once did he exclaim after this organization that if he should be taken out of the way, the church would remain organized. We remained in a gloomy, fearful situation for a short time when the death of Brother Joseph took place by the hands of the mob, showing to us much plainer than language could tell that the church was rejected if the head was taken from it. The church now stands rejected together with their dead. The church being rejected now stands alienated from her God in every sense of the word. Really interesting testimony from Lyman. How about this one from Orson Pratt, pulled from the Joseph Smith papers, from Joseph Smith history. Uh, this was this was in 1843. He says, there's some things I wish to mention. And this is about, uh, there are great blessings given to the faithful when the temple is finished. Let's skip down. God declares in his revelations the consequences of not building the house into his name within such a time period that he commanded. The Lord says, if you build the house in that time, you shall be blessed. But if not, you shall be rejected as a church with your dad, saith the Lord. So if that house isn't built, then in vain are all our cares, our faith and works, our meetings and hopes are vain. Also, our performances and acts will be void. So, section 115 gave us, in verse 12, those particulars of what the Lord required. Until it shall be finished, from the cornerstone to the top, not anything remain that's not finished. That's important to know, because that's what it, it's required to have this house be acceptable to me, he says. He says that very clearly. Verse 15, if they don't do it according to this, I won't accept it. Well, our history shows that the Nauvoo Temple was not finished upon the death of Joseph Smith, nor was it ever actually finished to that degree. It was largely finished. But look at those specifics in verse 12. And have nothing unfinished that should be finished. So for us, if 
that remained, then President Benson and Oaks and Nelson are right in a sense. They're under condemnation, but it wouldn't be that first level of condemnation anymore. It would be two levels higher. It would have been that escalation of the Lord's anger kindled against people. So they've broken the everlasting covenant, Isaiah says. And Isaiah is talking about the end times. Broken the everlasting covenant. So for us, understanding and knowing if this is what happened, that opens the door to us learning a greater truth for ourselves, what we need to do as a people.